When you have more than one rowdy section in the crowd, you're pretty sure people are done going through their outlines. If you haven't gotten an outline, you failed to pick one up, now would be a great time while I'm talking. Just go ahead and get up and grab them. They're right here in the, uh, in the doorway of the center section. We have pens there for you as well. Uh, if this is your first time out here, I just want to walk you through what I've given you. Uh, the first two pages, it's actually the first piece of paper, but it's both sides of the first page, uh, is, is kind of a guide, not just for tonight, but also for a follow-up conversation with, uh, with a spouse uh, for, for some time in the next week or two weeks. You've already done part one. Immediately after the message, I'm going to give you five minutes or so to go back and just personally reflect on part 2A. And then after that, we're going to break up into some small groups uh, and just get to know one another. I don't have you designed to share anything super personal in that time. It's just an opportunity to benefit from the council and the fellowship that can come through some other people. And then part three is designed, uh, part 2B, by the way, is questions for that small group section. And then part three is designed for... Uh, for a follow-up conversation uh, on this topic for you to have sometime in the next couple weeks. The second sheet of paper, which is also two-sided, is going to be an outline for the message I'm about to begin in a minute. And then the last page will go through that at the very end of my message. Okay? So this would be a good time to flip to that second sheet of paper uh, as I get started on the message there's a number of things I want to say up front before we jump in to the topic for tonight. The first one is a very important qualifier. We're going to be talking tonight about tools for communication. Last time we talked about directions for communication that comes straight out of the scriptures. Today is going to be a much more practical message on just tools for communication but I want to get your attention, if you are in, or maybe you're listening to this or watching online, if you're in a crisis situation, there's a marriage that's, that's, that's it's currently abusive, there's really harsh things happening in your marriage, I have no intention of these tools being able to deal with that situation. You can learn from what we're going to do tonight. Go ahead and take notes and learn from these tools. But in, at this moment, tools are not what you need. You need to deal with that situation. You need to get yourself to safety. You need to tell people who can change and bring protection for you in this time of crisis. And then hopefully down the road, as God brings healing in your marriage, there will be a time to apply these tools. Okay, so this is not intended to be a remedy. If you're currently the victim of something like a verbal abusive situation, my hope is that you wouldn't go home and start practicing these tools. Let's bring that out into the open so we can get that major problem addressed. And then these tools will come in handy later. Okay, I hope that's clear. The second thing, if you haven't pieced this together yet, I want to I wanna say it. Uh, the, the material that I've been teaching... Uh, last uh, series and this series all comes out of a book that I've written. I'm not here to sell copies or sign copies of the book. I'm just here for full disclosure that if you've read the book and you're like, man, this sounds really familiar, uh, it's because it's out of that book. So I I'm not attempting to promote it, but I want to acknowledge that uh, this material has been prepared in a different context. This is just a sermon form of that. Last meeting when we talked about those biblical foundations for communication, that was essentially chapter one out of the book. Tonight, we're gonna to be covering chapters four through eight at a super high level. I'm just gonna hit each of those chapters because each chapter is, is a separate tool. Okay, third, it seems appropriate, and I didn't have this in until this morning, but it seemed appropriate for me to give a really quick summary of where Gina and I have come from on this issue of communication. Some of you know our story, and I'm not going to take the time to tell the full story here. Let me just give you some highlights, or maybe lowlights is a better word for it. We have been very happily married since 1997, but our wedding was in 1995. Okay, those first two years were brutal years. 
They deteriorated from being happy to being a troubled marriage to being a tragic situation. We went from loving one another with our words to hurting one another with our words, and we devolved into no communication at all for a long stretch. When I say no, you'd be surprised how good we were at no communication for a long stretch. Thank you. Yeah, we're not there anymore. Glory to God. We started our marriage praying for one another, and we ended up praying that God would take one of us. Uh, there's no joke. We were literally praying that. I wish that was an attempt at humor. Uh, it, it, it was the only way we saw that we could get out of this marriage. God either needed to take me or her, and I'm ashamed to tell you which one I favored. And I share that so you know that the floods are not just naturally good at this. It isn't this guy who is just really good at communication that decided to write a book on it. It's a guy who was so in desperate need of help. When I, when I received help that changed our marriage, I want to share that. And that's, that's essentially why I wrote the book. I share with you our story so that the principles you're going to learn tonight and that we learned last time can be as useful for you as they were to us. And I want to speak to the assumption very many people have. When you walk into church on Sunday or maybe when you walked into this room tonight, you walk in perhaps knowing the challenges you have and you see all these handsome, beautiful, smiling faces in marriages that have no trouble. That is very, that, that's kind of the assumption we can bring when we look at a crowd of people. But we all bring our sin to bear. And we all need help. And so I want you to know, at least from the speaker's perspective here, if you came in here with a relationship that struggles to communicate, I get that. I've walked it, Jean has walked it, and many in this room have and are walking that. And then lastly, what I want to do before we jump into tonight is I want to do a very quick summary of what I taught last time, because the actual message tonight is going to be, like I said, very instructive, very practical. It's going to be admittedly Bible light. Okay, so I want to review the biblical foundations that we covered last time, so you can see these two messages as a set, okay, as the heads and the tails of the same coin. Last time we drew from 1 Peter 4.11 and Ephesians 4.29, just two verses from the Bible, there are four directions for how God wants us to use communication. Direction number one is we should speak so people encounter God and not us. Number two, we should build up with our words and not tear down. Number three, we should speak in a way that fits the occasion and four, we should give grace with our words. And then toward the end of the message, about two-thirds of the way into the message last time, I challenged you to listen with a rake rather than a shovel. How many of you remember that picture from last time? Yeah, listen with a rake rather than a shovel. When this truth and these helps are delivered to you tonight, they're thrown in front of you. You don't want to shovel them and throw them at your spouse's feet. Here, you apply this. You apply this. You want to grab a rake and drag it into yours so that you're applying it to yourself first. Okay, so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to build on that foundation with some very practical instructions or tools. And so I've named this message, The Power of Words, Practical helps for healthy communication. All right, before we jump in, why don't we pray? Father, we spend just about every area of our relationship is touched by communication. We spend so much time communicating. Lord, we need your help so that that communication is effective, so that it's God-glorifying, 
that it is gracious and edifying. Lord, we want to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. We want to do that not just in our quiet times or as we sing on Sundays. We want to do that as we relate with the people around us and in particular with our spouses in this relationship that reflects your relationship with your church. So Lord, would you, would you send your spirit to help me teach? Would you send your spirit to help everyone learn so that we leave here better disciples and more conformed into the image of your son? Do it because it'll bring you great pleasure. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, why do you buy a treadmill? Why do you go, do you join a gym? The end of those things, the goal is to become fit. Why do you buy books? The end goal of buying books is to grow or perhaps to be entertained. But we reach neither end goal unless we put to use what we get. Buying the treadmill doesn't make you thinner. Exhibit A, okay? Using a treadmill will. Buying books, you know, you can be an excellent book purchaser and be no more like Jesus because of your bookshelves. You need to read the books if you're going to grow and benefit from them. You have to go to the gym, not just have a gym membership. And this is the case with communication. If you want the fitness of your marital communication to grow, you have to do more than learn the rules. You have to abide by them. You have to do that. And there are tools that can help you do that. Learning the tools tonight will not suffice. It's good, it's necessary, but it's insufficient. You have to take the tools that you'll learn tonight with you and then go and put them to use. You don't want your communication on the ride home or tomorrow to be marked by an ignorance of these tools. You've, you'll learn them tonight. You want to use them and apply them and that will grow your communication. And so the message tonight is crafted as application or suggestions to be placed into the hands of people who want to honor God in their marriage. If you have no desire really to honor Jesus, these tools are going to prove really ineffective. These tools are not going to provide you motivation for change in your marriage. They're going to provide you means for change in your marriage. Living for the glory of Christ needs to be your motivation for change in your marriage. Okay? I'm trying to make sure I don't overpromise what I can't deliver. These tools are going to help you if your desire is to honor Christ. Does that make sense? Good. With all of that said, I have five tools, so we're just going to number them one at a time. The first one is this, the tool of first response. And this first tool is built on the following premise. The course of a conflict is determined by the person who responds, not the one who initiates. I'm going to repeat that. The course of a conflict is determined by the person who responds, not the one who initiates. Now, I may walk into a room and say something harsh or unkind to Gina, even something sinful to Gina. And once I do that, we don't yet have a conflict. One hand can't clap, and one sinner can't create a conflict. Okay? We have a conflict if she responds in kind. Now we have a conflict. What if the other person, however, decides not to fight? 
and to respond to the sin with kindness. What if the responder actually has more power and influence than we think? You see, the power of first response is significant, and Jesus demonstrates this over and over again in the Gospels. The Pharisees lay traps for him constantly. They initiate, they engage, they ask carefully crafted questions to where they know however he answers these questions, he's going to alienate some of his followers. And yet, the conversation never ends where they want it to go. His response redirects the conversation into some of the best teaching we have in the Scriptures. That is power found in the tool of first response. And with this tool, Proverbs 15.1 becomes very important. It says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Look at what's happening. A harsh word takes the action, and the result is it stirs up anger. But look at the first phrase. A soft answer turns away wrath. In the first half of that verse, who is starting the, who is initiating the engagement? It's wrath. Wrath is on its way. Wrath is coming, and it's a soft answer in the response that turns wrath away. Do you see that in Proverbs 15? Even though wrath is coming, a soft answer has more power than that and is able to turn it away. Now, if we acknowledge that that's true, what we're left with is the Lord engaging our hearts. When we are sinned against, our natural response is that we don't want to provide a soft answer. We don't want to respond kindly. We want to respond in kind. Okay? Wrath's coming at me. Well, listen, I got a whole bucket of wrath. I'm ready to unleash on you. And this conversation will end when one of us is wrathed out. But that doesn't reflect any of the instructions that we learned about in last meeting about building up and not tearing down, about giving grace about speaking so that people encounter God, not us. This is not how he speaks with us. And as disciples of Jesus, it's incumbent on us to be first responders in communication that answer with a soft answer. 1 Peter 3.9 helps us further. It says, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. So when evil comes our way, Peter tells us to bless. And earlier in 1 Peter, just the previous chapter, he gives us the example of Jesus in 2.23. He says when he, that's Jesus, was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus' response personally was not self-defense. It wasn't self-vindication. It was self-entrusting to God. God was bigger to Christ than the sin that was committed against him. God's ways to Jesus, were more desirable than the ways of the flesh. And therein lies the problem. Because when we're sinned against, when carelessness takes over the speech of someone who's talking to us, the responder right there, rather than reacting in the flesh, can choose to entrust themselves to God and to honor Him, to live for Him. And there is great great power in that. It is conflict redirecting power. It's conversation saving power. 
Now, what's in mind here is the normal exchange that occurs between husband and wife. I'm not talking about loud, unrelenting, angry tirades being released on one another. We need different solutions for that. I'm talking about the normal two sinners living together kind of sin that gets committed that 20 minutes later you forget why you're fighting but you're embattled now, you might as well finish it kind of conflict. Okay, there's power in this first tool, the tool of first response, but there's four more. Let me hit tool number two, the tool of prayer. And this tool is built on the premise that there is a third party always standing ready to help in communication. We do well in our marriages to stop thinking of us as just being husband and wife. Because marriage is a union of husband and wife in the will of God, according to the design of God, always in the presence of God. And when we fail to remember this, we miss the greatest resource we have available to us for communication, and that's prayer. If, if you're going to sit down to what you anticipate is going to be a difficult conversation, that's a great time to use this tool. Pray before you talk, asking for the Lord's help. Maybe you didn't know you were going to be having a difficult conversation until it got difficult. You can time out right then, just, hey, this is starting to get tense. Can can we just stop and pray together before we continue? Right in the middle of the challenge, it's okay to pray. Maybe you are in an all-out conflict that got ugly a long time ago. So much sin has happened, you couldn't possibly keep track. You can still stop right then and pray. Even if the conflict's over, all the damage has been done, there's still smoke coming up from the floors. You guys are in your neutral corners, figuring out who's going to move toward the other first. Even there in the Cold War portion of your marriage, you can pray, asking for grace and mercy to bring reconciliation. Friends, listen, if a conversation starts heading down a, a destructive or unhelpful path, you don't have to keep going just because you've taken your first steps there. You can actually stop three steps down the road and say, whoa, We didn't want to be here. We stop. We pray. We go back to the beginning. We start again. Conversations, conflicts, arguments can end just as abruptly as they began if you agree that you don't want to be in conflict. Sometimes our flesh just gets momentum. And neither of us wants to be doing what we're doing, but we're not going to be bested by the other person not doing it, not wanting to do it. And so we're going to not want to do it better than they don't want to not do it. All the while, you could just say, hey, hang on. I love you. I know you love me. This is not working. Let's just pray and start over again. There's a portion of a stanza from that hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Listen to this. I'm not going to sing it for you. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. How many marital conversations could be described as forfeited peace and needless pain? They're just not necessary. It's not necessary to harm one another in order to communicate. It's not if we would just be faithful to take these tense marital conversations to God in prayer. Without the tool of prayer, we allow these tense conversations to cause us to function like atheists, like God is not who he says he is, like he's not in the room. 
but I want to assure you what I know you already know. God is who he says he is, and he is in the room with you. He's present, and he stands ready to help you in your time of need. Okay, that's number two, the tool of prayer. Number three, the tool of physical touch. And it's built on this premise. It's not possible to fight with someone you are affectionately touching. One of my early drafts of this, I didn't have the word affectionately in there, and then it's, quite, it's very possible to fight with someone you are unaffectionately touching, but if you are affectionately touching someone, you will not fight with them. Here's how the tool works. You make a habit of always being very close to one another while you're communicating so that you can touch. Maybe it's holding hands. Maybe it's legs laying across the other person's legs and sitting next to each other. However you affectionately touch. You hold your hands and then you talk. Now here's what happens. As the conversation progresses... If it's starting to get tense, even before you know it, you're going to change your position so that you're not touching the other person. I guarantee you. I'm seeing hands come off each other right now. (laughs) Right? Listen, what you're doing subconsciously at a spiritual level is you're making room for the conflict. When you notice that you're not touching anymore, that's a yellow flag before there's any cause for a red flag. You know, about five minutes ago, I just I noticed we aren't touching. And now, if you're unaware of there being a problem, maybe it was your spouse who stopped touching. So you ask careful questions. Did I say anything that upset you? Is there anything that I did that tempted you? Or maybe you're the person who untouched. Rather than keeping that to yourself, you realize you're not touching. In humility and in kindness, share. You know, when you said that, that was really hurtful. You probably didn't even mean for it to be as hurtful as it was, but I want to tell you how I received that. Deal with the problem there before division happens, before volume escalates, and before there's damage. And right there, as you deal with the problem, you can demonstrate the, 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 the small reconciliations that are happening by reconnecting your hands and continuing in the conversation. If it, if it really hurt, maybe we need to go back to the tool of prayer at that time and, and ask for the Lord's help to continue in grace. And then you reconnect with the tool of physical touch and you continue. If you've not used this, and this sounds silly to you, let me just tell you, it actually works. Over and over and over again, it works. This tool of physical touch. Number four, the tool of mirroring. This tool helps you work through any individual misunderstandings, or even if there's a pattern of misunderstandings, if you find yourself regularly in a conflict where the words, that's not what I meant, get spoken, then you are primed and ready for the tool of mirroring. With this tool, here's what it is. Conversations only proceed when we're able to accurately articulate what the other person is saying. Okay, essentially, one person, let's, let's do this side, one person makes a point. Then, rather than the usual pattern of this person making a counterpoint, this person slows down and says, here's what I hear you saying. And then they do their best to repeat what they're saying, not word for word, that will not land well. But here's what I hear you saying, the essence of what I hear you saying Here's the most important part of this tool. Please, everybody, don't miss this. It was important enough I included this point in your outline. The first person gets to decide if this person has summarized their point accurately. 
Well, here's what I hear you saying. They summarize it. Then this person says, no, 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 that's not what I meant. Yes, it is. Well, we've just fallen apart. We've fallen off the mirroring horse. Okay? The way this tool works is if the person who actually said the thing gets to determine what they meant. I've said it three different ways now. The same kind of, are you tracking me? That's really important because it unravels if you somehow assume that you know the hearts of mankind when only God knows the inner man, right? That you know how to read minds and that you somehow have the authoritative interpretation of this person's motivations. Let me suggest you're not qualified for the job. So you repeat what is said, and then this person says, okay, wait, that's, that's not really what I meant. Here's what I meant. Okay, so that's different in this way, right? Yes, yes, that's it. Okay, now this person gets to respond. By the time you actually come to an agreement on what's being said, now there's no misunderstandings. You can have an entire relationship that's not marked by conflicts that say that's not what I meant. This tool frees you from that. It is really slow going. It'll slow down your conversation. But isn't it better to go slower and be on the same page than try to go more quickly and miss one another? Okay, the tool of mirroring will get you there. It's awkward. If you're not 100% in it, when you try it, it, it may even feel silly to you, but if there's regular misunderstanding or if you, if, if you regularly are telling friends, man, when we talk, I feel like we just talk past one another, here's a way out. The tool of mirroring is a way out. It's hard work. I suggest you use the tool of physical touch while you're doing mirroring. You stay connected to one another. If you keep mirroring back and they're like, no, that's not what I meant. No, that's not what I meant. Stop. Go back to the tool of prayer and pray. Ask the Lord for understanding, for help, and then return to mirroring. But you will communicate more effectively with one another by applying that tool. And then there's the last one. The tool of proper timing. Now, we covered this. You may remember way back at the beginning when I summarized the points from last message uh, there's as fits the occasion, that we need to speak in a way that fits the occasion. That's this tool of proper timing. But it's built on this premise. It's possible to say the right thing at the wrong time and be out of step with the will of God. What you're saying may be 100% true. In fact, what you're saying may really need to be said for the well-being of the other person. But if you say the right thing that they need to hear, but you say it at the wrong time, you're out of step with the will of God. The Bible, the Old, the Old Testament, Proverbs will call this a, a, an apt word fitly spoken. Meaning it, it's spoken well at the right time. To know the proper timing, there's a key to it. You actually have to be looking for it. You have to be aware that you speak into occasions. And you have to have eyes. Is this the occasion for what I'm about to say? It is an application from James who tells us to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Let me, let me listen, not just for understanding, which mirroring helps us with, but let me listen to determine what, how is this person emotionally? How open are they to hearing? How am I doing emotionally? How, am I really in a place where I can deliver this with grace? What is the occasion that you're using? We've often taught our children, we'll get to the flood vernacular here in a minute, but we've often taught our children to enter a room with their eyes first rather than with their voices or their bodies so when they, when they break into a room and they just assume the room has been waiting for them to come and speak, that is ignoring the occasion that's been going on in the room. 
Okay, at this point in our, in our household, we just say the words eyes and ears, and they know exactly what we mean. Enter with your eyes, enter with your ears, don't enter with your voice just yet. Okay, if, if, peop, if people are doing nothing, okay, go ahead and speak. You may be walking right into a really sensitive conversation, and if you're not aware of that, you will speak into an occasion wrongly. And it's the same thing with marriages. The goal is to determine the condition of the hearer to the best of your ability so that your words are fitly spoken. Your words fit the occasion. Listen, if your home still has children in it, young or old, there are likely times of noise and chaos. And there are other times, maybe few and far between, of quiet and peace. Be on the lookout for which is which. And then make your words match the occasion. If there's noise and chaos all over the place, that's probably not the time to bring up something that's going to require a long, careful response. Don't hate the chaos. That's part of raising a family. So love the chaos. Just be aware, okay, this is not the moment for us to talk about this. I'm going to wait until this moment for us to talk about this. Also, in marriage particularly, all of these tools, by the way, work with parenting as well. Just have to change a couple illustrations. Um, you want to take the emotional temperature of the room. It could be that the room is quiet because everybody's just doing something quiet and everybody's ready to hear you. But it could be that the room is quiet because something really hard just happened. And it's kind of the aftermath. That Knowing the difference on why it's quiet will totally change what you feel free to speak into that moment. And then lastly, not just the chaos, not just the, the temperature. You want to be a student of your spouse. And then care about what you learn. Okay, Don't just learn them so you know where all the buttons are. You want to learn them so that... You know what times are good for them to talk about serious things. What times are bad for them to talk about serious things. And I don't necessarily just mean times of the day, but the rhythm of the day. Maybe the first 30 minutes after work is not the best time to talk. Maybe that's all decompression from what happened during the day. Maybe the first 30 minutes of the day are not the best time. Or maybe I'm just confessing for myself. Maybe they're great for you. Okay, but know your spouse and be willing, if your great times don't line up, be willing to trust God for you to speak in, in a less desirable time for yourself so that you can choose the better time for them to hear. Okay, now I want to pull all of these tools together. First, let me point out what may be obvious to you. I haven't called these five easy steps to healthy communication. They're tools. And let me illustrate why that difference matters. If there's a small home project I have to do, and I say small because if you know me well, I'm not taking on anything bigger than a small home project. Okay? But if there's a small home project, home repair that I have to do, I've got a toolbox that I'll take with me. It's got all the common tools I would need. I take it with me, and then while I'm there, I may not use most of them, but I take them with me. I assess what the problem is, and then I reach in and I get the tool I need. Okay? One job may need a hammer. One job may need pliers. One job may need a screwdriver. Okay? Every job does not need a hammer and then pliers and then a screwdriver. Those would be steps to home repair. We bring all the tools with us. We use the ones that the problem requires. Okay? I don't want you to... Uh, th these tools are not intended for you to take home and use number one, and then number two, and then number three, and number four, and number five. They aren't always applicable in all situations. What I'm hoping you'll do is you'll take these tools and you'll throw them in your communication toolbox and you'll bring them with you to every conversation, 
using the ones that you need to use. Does that make sense? But it goes beyond the need of the home project. It goes beyond the need of the conversation. The tools, the need for the tools will vary from one couple to another. The tools that Gina and I might need to get through a difficult conversation may differ greatly from the tools you need to get through the same kind of conversation on the same topic. So what could it look like? I want to bring it together. What could it look like to have these tools come together for you? Well, let's, let's imagine that there's a married couples meeting at your church and the pastor is teaching on tools for marital communication. Okay, you got that picture in your head? Good. After the meeting, I'm recommending everybody use the tool of proper timing. What is the temperature in your car on the way home? Could be for one couple, you guys are just really excited about the opportunity to apply some of these. Uh, uh, several topics have popped up that you want to take through some of the tools and you, you, you want to apply them. Maybe the ride home is the perfect time for some couples. Maybe the ride home is the absolute worst time to start talking about some, some topic for other couples. In either case, no matter which couple you are, the tool of proper timing works. You're raising the questions. You're applying the tool. You're figuring out what the tool reveals, and then you're acting accordingly. It'll vary greatly what you talk about, the length of the conversation, the weight of the conversation, or whether there's any conversation at all. The tool of proper timing will work. When you do talk, I recommend using the tool of prayer, but that's going to look very different from one couple to another. For some, you may be very uncomfortable praying together for some reason, and so maybe you just take a moment, you each have your moment of silence where you pray quietly to the Lord in your own hearts. For others, it could just be one spouse praying for the conversation that's about to happen, the husband or the wife. For others, it could be a 15, 20-minute season of prayer that you have where you're praying through these things, taking turns back and forth, and then when it's done, you get into the conversation. I don't want to tell you how to pray. I'm encouraging you, invite Jesus to be a part of the conversation, however you do that. These tools are flexible, and they can be used in any couple that's here. But they're not guaranteed steps that work in exactly the same way for each couple. They're principled tools placed into your hands to help you in succeeding with marital communication. Okay, let me close with this illustration. I want you to think of communication as train tracks. Okay, the cargo in the train is your, your love for one another, your concerns, your burdens, maybe your offenses, or the, the places you desire to see change. If the tracks are broken, if they're damaged, if there's debris all over the tracks, then the burdens, the love, the concerns, the areas for needed growth, they never get to their destination. Okay? The brokenness of the communication actually stops what must be communicated for our marriages to grow. So what do you do to get the cargo where it needs to go? You got to clear the tracks. You got to fix the tracks. When we fix the tracks, the cargo gets where it needs to go. And this is what we do with our communication. When our communication is broken, we don't give up on it. And let that cargo just rot and let the relationship fade into indifference. We press toward the brokenness, no matter how broken it feels. And we do what Jesus did. We entrust ourselves to God and we work on the marriage to the glory of God. We bring the whole toolbox and we use the tools that are needed 
so that we can fix those tracks and communicate with one another. Listen, as you consider working on your communication, as you consider using some or all of these tools, let me encourage you, before God, individually recommit that you will not harm one another in your communication. Commit to that before God. Commit to the directions that we received in the last message. Don't allow your shaky communication skills to shake your foundation that you're standing on. Don't allow being quickly offended by one another to squelch even the small growth that God may allow. If you refuse to harm one another, if you refuse to take up offense, tiny growth that's difficult to see with the naked eye eventually becomes life change, eventually becomes transformative growth. So resolve to be united and then communicate in a way that maintains that unity. At the very end of the book, I wrote a communication vow. This is going to be the last page, by the way, of your outline. It's a commitment for each spouse to use words in keeping with what the book teaches, in keeping with what the scriptures teach, and in keeping with these tools. And I'm going to end our time by reading the vow. Some portions of the vow, as I read it, may feel awkward when you think about your own marriage. Let me encourage you to make those awkward portions focal points for prayer. Because God desires for you to thrive in your communication. He's eager to help you. He can work in and through your weaknesses. Okay, here's the communication vow. With these words, I will seek to build you up rather than tear you down. With these words, I will do all I can to reiterate what you mean in a way that honors and respects you. With these hands, I will touch you caringly, seeking unity even through the hardest conversations. With these eyes, I will look on you tenderly, avoiding judgment and scorn. With these ears, I will listen intently to understand what you are trying to say. With this heart, I will seek to love the Lord first and foremost, loving you all the while. With these words, I will share grace, mercy, and forgiveness as it has abundantly been shared with me by our Savior. And with God's help, our communication will draw us more closely together for the good of our home and the glory of God. I want to end our time the way Jude ends his letter, folks. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. I want to pray for you before we go into personal reflection. Father, would you please show your kindness to the couples that are here. Show your kindness to the couples that may be watching or listen to this years down the road. You are jealous for our relationships, our marriage relationship, to reflect your love for the church and the church's devotion to you. And Lord, we need your help for that because we're not very good at that on our own. Lord, for that couple that's here that has long given up hope on communication, would you restore hope right now as I'm praying. For the couple that assumes they've got this nailed down, would you keep them humble for whatever trials may lie ahead? And for all the rest of us, Lord, would you cause us to use our words for your glory, realizing that our words have great power. Spirit, come. 
and help us in our times of need. In Jesus' name, amen.